Good day, everyone. Welcome to another episode of PHS Talks, a virtual presentation of the Peterborough Historical Society. Today, we welcome as our speaker, Ken Brown, a recognized specialist of Peterborough's business history. Among his publications is the important book, The Canadian Canoe Company and the Early Peterborough Canoe Factories. The subject of Ken's talk today is Robert Romain, a successful Peterborough businessman who is less well known than more prominent and frequently studied families like the Nichols, Burnham's, Halls, or individuals like George Cox and Joseph Flavel. By examining the many enterprises of Robert Romain, Ken Brown illuminates his fascinating life and opens a new window on the early business history of Peterborough. Welcome, Ken Brown. Thank you, Dale. April 23rd, 1888, in the House of Commons, Sir John, dressed fully in black, his face ashen, rose slowly to his feet to speak. The seat directly behind him was ominously empty. Tears were running down his face. He sobbed audibly. The man whose golden tongue could emit eloquently for hours at a time, both sober and otherwise, was rendered speechless. Mr. Speaker, he gasped and staggered but his sobs choked him and his tongue refused utterance. He sat down and continued to weep. His beloved political companion and lieutenant, Minister of the Interior, Thomas White, had died at age 59. One afternoon in the fall of 1849, the Rice Lake steamboat moored at the wharf in the ramshackle town of Peterborough. A 19-year-old man, that same Thomas White, disembarked and surveyed the unknown frontier town before him. His father, a bootmaker in Montreal, had sent a wholesale shipment of shoes to Peterborough, and it had gone astray. Young Thomas White was sent to see what had become of it. The goods were located, but local retailers were disinterested. So White rented space in a store on George Street and sold not only the first pair of ready-made boots in Peterborough, but his entire stock. Boot and shoemaker Thomas White Sr. soon followed to Peterborough and established a permanent shop in Robert Rose George Street block. Thomas and younger brother Richard initially worked with their father, but Thomas soon moved on to Toronto, Brantford, and by 1851 was in Quebec City working on the Canada Gazette with Stuart Derbyshire, the Queen's printer. He lived there with his older sister and her husband, who also worked for Derbyshire. In the spring of 1853, his father and the Peterborough business opportunity beckoned. 23-year-old Thomas White and his Quebec City brother-in-law, Robert Romain, moved to Peterborough. They established a printing establishment in what became Peterborough's most prestigious newspaper, the Peterborough Review. Some equipment was salvaged from the defunct offices of the Peterborough Gazette. At least one press was brought from Quebec. It came in the custody of the brother-in-law, a man who usually described his background as having been the Queen's printer. In fact, Robert Romain was foreman in the print shop of Derbyshire and Deborah in Quebec City. For most of the next 26 years, he was an interesting and useful contributor to the building of Peterborough. Initially, while Thomas White ran the newspaper, Romaine ran the bookstore downstairs and was a printer and bookbinder. The bookstore, in fact, was more than that, offering wallpaper, new to Peterborough imported coal oil and lamps, and even violins, flutes, and accordions. It was arguable that like many newspaper establishments, the review was mainly a print shop, serving the commercial printing needs of the town. A division that created a newspaper was essentially a consistent and regular customer. The review, although espoused to be an independent voice, clearly became the mouthpiece of conservative political, political perspective. Thomas White brought more to Peterborough than the role of self-invented newspaper man. He was Sunday school superintendent at George Street Methodist Church. He was an early town clerk presiding over council meetings before going back to the newspaper office to review them. He was an eloquent speaker, a temperance advocate, and the writer and publisher of the initial brief histories of Peterborough. The first was the 12-page preamble to the 1858 directory of Peterborough and the counties of Peterborough, Northumberland, Victoria, which was published by the Review. It was the first extensive local history. The second was an exhibit on the progress position and resources of the County of Peterborough, Canada West, based on the census of 1861. 
1861, White had been the local census taker, and from that exercise published the above noted useful booklet. He had been census taker by virtue of political connections, and that connection's name was MacDonald. Sir John, the ultimate networker, had close relations with other Peterburians of the day, including Peterborough West MLA John Langton, who he appointed Canada's first Auditor General, and a great friend, local Tory representative George Barker Hall, and subsequently Hall's widow Elizabeth, writer of the celebrated All My Love From Your Loving Lizzie letter to MacDonald. Of course, MacDonald in, in the 1850s would have taken a personal interest in any and all conservative newspapermen in Canada West. Early on, he identified Thomas White and his younger brother Richard as comers to be groomed. And in due course, they would be more useful to him in larger centers than Peterborough. MacDonald clearly helped massage their way on to the Spectator in Hamilton and then the Montreal Gazette in their hometown. When the White brothers left Peterborough by 1864, the review became the property and mouthpiece of their brother-in-law, Robert Romaine, who is the subject of the remaining discourse. And there's an early photo from LAC of Margaret and Robert Romaine. It was taken by Notman in Montreal, uh, which is where they were married. This may or may not be a marriage photo from the late 1840s. It's unclear. Robert Romaine was an interesting bunch of guys, a passionate newspaperman, a book publisher, a lifelong inventor, an industrialist, an imaginer of immigration and other schemes, and a man ambitiously looking to bring new things to Peterborough. Robert Romaine was born in 1820 in Quebec City to a French father and Scottish mother. In 1834, he apprenticed in the printing trade in due course becoming the printing superintendent, who in 1844 introduced steam printing to the business of his friend, the best man at his wedding, Stuart Derbyshire. He was, he claimed, the first printer in Canada to introduce steam printing. Romaine and Tom White established the review in 1853, but Romaine was not initially in town for long. Other passions took him away for over seven years to England, eight months in France, and a season in one of the best book and job offices in New York. Romaine had introduced the steam engine to printing while in Quebec City, and his inventive mind then leaped to applying it to agriculture. Just as he was leaving Quebec in May 1853, he obtained an English patent for improvements in seed planters and published a pamphlet entitled A Few Remarks on Plowing and Pulverizing by Steam Power. Romaine conceived the idea of a steam plow in 1850 with a plan credible enough to inspire considerable English financial support for a first machine. A second Romaine machine was also built in Canada under the encouragement of Lord Elgin and was sent at the expense of the provincial government to the second of the world fairs in Paris in 1855. Romaine himself went to the exhibition as a commissioner for Upper Canada. After considerable traumatic testing and adjustments, the machine completed a private run in France. This was satisfactory enough that the English agricultural equipment manufacturers Croskull of Beverly, Yorkshire approached Romaine with an offer. We want to develop your machine, but it must be withdrawn from the World's Fair display so that no one else can see what it can do. Notwithstanding the considerable Canadian government investment made to send him and his equipment to represent Canada on the world stage, Romaine took the deal. Canadian Commission Secretary Taché's government report on the fair referred to Romaine's very uncommon mechanical talents. A French mechanician, author of the history of mechanics in the 19th century went further, quote, the problem of the application of steam to the plow has been completely solved by a Canadian mechanician, if only the word completely were appropriate. So this is a, um, an image that's taken from Practical Mechanics Journal, which is published in Glasgow in 1856. This shows a uh, elevation view of the combined horse and steam cul cultivator created by Robert Romaine. And you can see at the left, the in, this is the plan view from the top, but you can see from the left, the handle where it was attached to a team of horses. This was a, uh, a digger that was dragged around to different locations in a field by a team of horses. 
and it's did it did its job digging and then they moved on to a new location and there's one more picture Dale. this is uh robert romaine living on apart from this lecture we can find him on the internet as a poster and this is reproduced here at great expense at uh, an image of the rotary digger from an old 1850s publication it was this machine for which in November of 1854, a patent was issued to Robert Romain of Peterborough, Ontario, relating to certain improvements in machinery or apparatus for affecting agricultural operations. The machine was a steam-driven rotary digger weighing several tons, maneuvered on wheels in a field by a team of horses. The patent application included 11 full handwritten pages by Romain, which lists 12 advances which he claimed patent protection for. It is a challenging read. Development of this machine intermittently possessed Robert Romain for most of his working life. There were other international patents, write-ups in international journals and newspapers, and two more models built in England. In 1882, then living in Ottawa, he published Romain's Modern Steam Farmer. Quote, having explained fully the difficulties I met with in prosecuting my invention of the rotary digging machine, I will now as briefly as possible explain how I have overcome these difficulties. The publication included numerous prestigious testimonials from academic and business circles, including Sanford Fleming, all of whom had, quote, examined the drawings and specifications and have expressed themselves highly satisfied with the mechanical details. Clearly, they did not examine an actual working machine. But the vision carried on. In 1898, long after Romain's death, a farm journal reported on a trial run of the latest development of the Romain automatic agricultural machine in Montreal. Peterborough has a long and notable history of manufacturing industrial farm equipment and steam engines. But before the major names of the Peter Hamilton Company, or John White and William Hamilton had even started their businesses, a brash young new Peterborian had attracted international attention for his patented agricultural equipment at the Paris World's Fair. It's a remarkable story. When the White family moved on to Hamilton in 1864, Robert Romain stepped up to acquire the review. At the time, he was employed by the Whites at $1,000 per year to operate the printing establishment and bindery. His acquisition cost of the paper was $2,000, but no money changed hands. The Whites already owed their older brother-in-law $2,500, so that debt was simply reduced. Perhaps Romain took on the review as his only means of collecting on the family loan. Although the White brothers did become wealthy in newspaper publishing, it wasn't in Peterborough. Romain carried on printing the weekly review, then selling for $1.75 per for a yearly subscription and running the book bindery. He designed and printed custom legal books that were distributed all over the province and became the firm's wide, re because of the firm's wide reputation, as far as the registry office in Winnipeg. So if you look in archival sources at some of the old account books and particularly the relating to real estate, you see this sticker on the inside that Robert Romain made account books and stationery and any number of documents that are pre-printed for the use in registry offices and everywhere else. And the next picture, Dale. Here's his letterhead of the day, 1871, and it describes the nature of what the business was. He was not only the newspaper, but he was a Peterborough Review steam book and job printing house, book bindery, stationery store, that was the scope of the operations back in 1871. Robert Romain did not live an extravagant life. He mostly lived modestly in rented accommodation, the stone house still standing on the south side of Hunter Street, east of Stewart. For years, he seemed joined at the hip to the hustling businessman and politician John Carnegie Jr. We find them both involved in the 1860s in establishing the Peterborough Gas Company on Simcoe Street, which gave the town its first street lighting and also running the Mechanics Institute, the St. Andrews Society, the Rifle Club, and the Board of St. Andrews Church. Romain hired Carnegie as his editor of the Review in the early 1870s. In 1867, the Review published the third and by far the most complete history of Peterborough, written by Thomas Poole. 
In the mid 1870s, it published the Farmer's Annual Almanacs. Until 1878, the review was a weekly publishing every Friday. 1876 circulation was 1,368, while the Examiner at 1,050 published on Thursday and the Morning Times on Saturday with a circulation of 1292. There was in those days passionate advocacy presented by all the newspapers. On one occasion, Stratton of the Examiner was attacked on the street by someone he had offended. In 1874, Romaine sued railway promoter John Fowler for $2,000 on account of defaming him in the Examiner. Fowler countersued for $10,000. It's unclear whether the financial discrepancy related to the quality of the slander or the perceived self-worth of the claimants. Romaine's public service included a stint on the Board of Education and one memorable year on town council in 1874. He worked tirelessly that year as an advocate for construction of waterworks for the town. There were obvious benefits, possibly cleaner water from Hilliard's upstream dam to drink, sewage disposal and fire protection for downtown buildings. But his scheme was deemed too expensive and was put off for another day, another year. Romaine did not choose to run for council in 1875. Perhaps he was tired of that bunch, or they were tired of him, or just as likely he was highly distracted by attention to other things. Other things were in fact twofold. One was a publishing undertaking and the other a substantial new business venture. First was publication of the historic 1875 Romaine's map of Peterborough. The town had some early modest modest mapping done by various surveyors and a full map published by a young Sanford Fleming in 1846. Beginning in 1865, surveyors Fitzgerald and Bulger had compiled a new map, solicited subscriptions, even announced imminent publication. A subsidy request to council was unfulfilled and their project died. Their plans were accumulated by printer Robert Romaine. Romaine fiddled with them for a few years without executing. It was clear that the draft map in hand would soon become obsolete because the town would be expanding. Finally, in 1872, Peterborough's size did increase from its original modest 560 acres to 1,388 acres by appropriation of additional lands from the neighboring townships. A request to the provincial government, an act passed, and the annexation deed was done. The town now extended south to, from Townsend Street to Lansdowne, west from Park to Monaghan, north of Park Hill into Smith Township, and claimed the Auburn business lands from Duro. So now there would be a town subsidy since governments needed to register a proper map of the new town. In November 1874, Romaine acquired a new Scotch wood press capable of producing mammoth posters. The size of the map he printed on it was substantial, 45 and three quarter inches by 64 and three quarters. It sold for $10. It was not acknowledged to be the work of the surveyors, but rather titled Romaine's Map of the Town of Peterborough. It is a remarkable snapshot of 1875 Peterborough and lives on as a reproduction in the Peterborough Historical Atlas produced in 1975 and more visibly on the entrance wall of the Ashburnham Ale House. <laughs> And there's Mr. Romaine's bold declaration as to what his map is. Forget Fitzgerald and Bulger, this is the Romaine map of Peterborough and Ashburnham. And the next one, Dale. This is a excerpt from the map and it shows a foreshadowing of the story that's coming next, which is Romaine's brickworks. You can see the Tonneby River and the waterfront in downtown Peterborough. And at the lower center area, you see R. Romaine's brick and tile factory. The map, in fact, showed all the streets of the town. It showed who owned what property and it located many of the buildings. So that was one of the great accomplishments of this um, map in 1875. 1875 was the year of the map in Peterborough. In that year, a Chicago company published Herman Brosius's Bird's Eye View of Peterborough, an equally remarkable achievement. There's much more to that story, but let me make just one observation. A committee of council recommended supporting a requested subsidy for production of the bird's eye map and purchase of 50 copies. When that motion reached council, where one Robert Romaine presided, the subsidy request was denied. 
In 1874-75, the Peterborough Review publisher had an even more substantial distraction. He had determined that he should assemble downtown land and build a substantial brickworks. And to the amazement of the town, that is what he did. The location was Peterborough's oldest industrial site, the southern end of the nine acre area leased for the crown in 1822 by Charles Fothergill for a mill site, which Adam Scott established at the foot of King Street. Romaine assembled several lots in that area, currently the no frills parking lot, and built his factory. Not being willing to use someone else's bricks, he constructed his factory of concrete. I have seen it described as, quote, the first concrete stru structure in the Dominion, or maybe just first in Peterborough, or maybe one of the first. Locally, we had no shortage of sand and gravel to make the concrete. The lime was brought in from Georgetown and the cement had to be shipped in from England. Canada did not manufacture cement until 15 years later. The building was described as one of the largest brick-making establishments in the province. The main structure measured 100 feet by 130. A remarkable feature of the brickworks was its 400-ton chimney. Just north of the new brickyards was the industrial block of the Peter Hamilton Manufacturing Company, described in the days before street numbering as being at the tall chimney. Well, not anymore. Constructed with 130,000 bricks, the Romain factory chimney was a statement matching the ego and ambition of its builder, reaching a level that would likely still have it as the highest structure in downtown Peterborough. One newspaper said it was 135 feet, another 125. The insurance plans say about 150. In the mid-1880s, there was a news story of a girl climbing up the inside of the Romain 200-foot chimney and peering over the top. By comparison, the top of the Market Hall cupola weighs in at a modest 122 feet 9 inches, with the top of the clock only being at 83 foot 3 inches, and that's according to Ken Trevelyan, heritage architect for the Market Hall. So there's a, a view looking south, and you can see, if you're looking for a benchmark, the railway bridge at Mariah Street joining across. <laughs> Uh, south of the Romaine factory. This is after the days of the factory being in production. And you can see uh, the bay to the south. Uh, Canada Packers, I don't think is there. Um, but that's the chimney. And those are the remnants of, of that, uh, of the buildings as they stood sometime in the 1880s. We know it's the 1880s because that bridge for the railway didn't go in until 1883-1884. Romaine brought in modern equipment from England to support an elaborate new technology system of pressing and continuous kilns for burning the brick. Romaine brought some clay from Potter Robert Westcott's lot near the current Trent winds, but shipped most from a lot on the Otonabee River bank about three miles below town using his steamboat and three scows which moored at the riverbank north of Dalhousie. His neighbor to the Mia north was Henry Calcutt, who parked his 105-foot steamboat at the Sherbrooke Street Wharf. We have a map photo of that, Dale. So there's a map from the, those days showing the Otonabee River, and you can see just north of Dalhousie Street, the Romaine's brickworks identified. And if you look closer inside, you can see it says there's the wharf, Calcutt's Wharf is at the foot of Sherbrooke Street. And there's another wharf along the shoreline of the brickworks. Uh, and you can see that there's a steamboat and three scows packed there, parked there. Note that we would think in these modern days, you might locate a sandbar as something for navigation. But in this case, at the bottom right side, you see a sawdust bar, which was a feature of any uh, river which is below a mill. Romaine and Calcutt were sometimes friendly, making mutual pleas for the to the waterway management against the evil lumberman's logs and sawdust in the river and lake. Sometimes they were not, with an exasperated Calcutt pleading with both Superintendent Belcher and the Public Works Department in Ottawa to tell Romaine to park his craft without blocking the river channel. Calcutt, himself a strong personality, had been unable to capture Romaine's attention. 
Calco was not the only one who had unhappy interactions with Romaine. Mark Curtis, dean of the local brickmaking fraternity, dropped by the plant to visit his fellow brickmaker and see the modern methods for himself. Romaine told Curtis to get out. He wrapped his arm around Curtis's shoulder and escorted him away, accompanied, according to Curtis, by language not fit to be repeated by any gentleman. Romaine evolved away from newspaper work to spend more and more time at his brickwork. 21 years after his world's fair attendance in Paris, he was at the first great American event, the Philadelphia Centennial Exhibition, showing his bricks and the pottery of Robert Westcott. So there's an example of bricks from the old day. Um, you can see a clear statement of the character of the personality of the brickmaker. There's Mark Curtis and Sons. Uh, that was a hundred year old multi-generational exercise in brickmaking uh, in Peterborough and the very bold statement of Robert Romain Peterborough brickmaker in the brick at the top. The Romain brickyard failed after a few years. Clearly it had not been a visionary call to bring the clay to a downtown manufacturing yard rather than to make the bricks where the clay was. There was also no shortage of competition in an industry that went back almost to the town's beginning. Curtis family yards along Park Hill Road East, Edward Heap just south of there on the current Manise Avenue, and the long established yard on River Road South established by Stephen Wood in 1855, and later operated in part by the Welch family, Brownscombe, the Potter, and James Rose. During the 1870s, an unfortunate time of financial depression, local brick supply exceeded demand. Romaine advertised his brick at $6 a thousand at the kiln. John Wilch on the River Road advertised at $4.75 per thousand. As far back as 1871, Romaine had borrowed considerable money from lumberman George Hilliard, whose family his close friend John Carnegie had married into. As the brickyard operations began, he borrowed there further from Carnegie himself and from the Carnegie Hilliard marriage settlement. He hoped to alleviate his debt by applying for public support. Beginning in 1872, the town of Peterborough was authorized to provide a financial bonus to attract manufacturing industry. Any such scheme required council approval and that of a ratepayer plebiscite and ultimately provincial endorsement. Normally ratepayers voted to support a subsidy, but not for Robert Romain. Foolishly, he did not even apply until the fall of 1875, even though the business had opened in June. And needless to say, his pitch was vilified in the Examiner and the Morning Times. Everything Romaine had, including the review, was pledged as security for his brickyard loans. By January 1878, Robert Romaine was no longer owner of the Peterborough Review. It now belonged to his mortgager, John Carnegie, who carried on publishing it with E.J. Toker. In early 1879, Carnegie, the mortgage holder, became the owner of the brickyard as well. For a short time, Carnegie and Urquhart, an Ottawa partner, operated the yard, and then it was done. The building sat, sat empty until January 1888, when they were removed and expanded to accommodate William Law's Bridgeworks operation. Subsequent uses of that land were diverse. Law's Central Bridgeworks was succeeded by the Oudry family from France establishing a pea factory. The adjoining riverbank then was lined with boathouses. When the pea factory burned, many young men took to the river to rescue the fancy launches moored there. Still later, inventor and mechanic Roland Wilson operated Peter Burr Machine and Lubricator Company there. Wilson's premises accommodated another mechanical inventor named Tom Blaney, who built dustless street sweeping equipment he had invented in part of the shop. On the George Street frontage, an 1890s three-story brick structure housed the first Ackerman leather factory, then other manufacturing establishments, and for seven years, the works of the Canadian Canoe Company. And then a Coca-Cola plant, a national grocer's warehouse, and Peterborough's first Canadian tire location. This has been a busy, busy, and very diverse industrial location. But what of Robert Romain, when he had lost it all in early 1879? Well, now we return full circle to where this story began, with brother-in-law Thomas White longtime associate of Sir John. In 1878, on his fourth attempt, White was elected to Parliament. 
The next year, it just so happened that there was a necessary job for Robert Romain with the government in Ottawa. Many cried foul against the patronage, but could they have expected any difference from MacDonald, a lifetime master of that game? Would he not have had a job for a veteran conservative newspaper publisher, brother-in-law of one of his new star members? In February of 1879, Robert Romain became chief of stationery for the federal government in Ottawa, salary $1,000 per annum. A year later, a shameless $1,400. Quote, without any respect to the claims of older employees, said the critics. His old paper, The Review, said that his salary increase was because he was doing the work of three or four people previously did. By 1885, the salary was up to $1,650 per annum. As usual, Romain brought his still active passion to Ottawa, both to his work and other outlets. If it is argued that an aging man can be measured and respected for maintaining his curiosity and engagement to the end, Romain in Ottawa deserves our respect. Earlier, it was noted that he published the treatise Romain's Modern Steam Farmer there in 1882. Related to this, in 1884, he patented another new system of an apparatus for farm cultivation and harvesting. In 1886, there was a further Romaine patent registered for a vessel for breaking and removing ice. Throughout his life, Romaine was never short of an eclectic portfolio of ideas and vision, which he was more than willing to share. In 1883, and again in April 1884, a House of Commons committee interrogated him on his Western Canada colonization plan. Quote, he proposes layout of a series of villages along the line of the CPR and related branch lines. He proposes that farmers should live in these villages, having communication with their farms by a system of tramways operated either by horse or steam power. In February of the same year, Romain, Romain then titled proofreader, English and clerk of stationery, issued and defended to a commons committee struck by his brother-in-law, a report on how to manage the printing needs of the government. Should it be by the historic contract system or by an in-house printing empire? The government agreed with his in-house proposal. The newspapers later reported that Thomas White, Minister of the Interior, was shamelessly booming his brother-in-law, Robert Romain, for the position of Chief of the new Bureau of Public Printing. Robert Romain remained in Ottawa as a federal government employee until his death in 1892. So what is the legacy of dreamer visionary Robert Romain? Well, the products of his gas company are gone, entirely consumed by customers. The manufacturing residuals on Simcoe Street near the river created Peterborough's first of a great many toxic in industrial sites where the poisons continue to leach until this day. His mechanical inventions never achieved commercial production and now exist only as forgotten sketches and quirky posters you can acquire on the internet. On a more positive note, Romain was a part of the creation of three written town histories. And although most of the newspapers found their way to local fireplaces, privies and landfill, they do remain digitally online as an extensive archival record of our town. There's the remarkable 1875 map. And also in terms of history in 1864, Romain hired a 14-year-old Frank Dobbin and groomed him to work for the Review. Dobbin himself became a highly esteemed local newspaper man and arguably Peterborough's most useful historian. There are also, of course, lots of Romain bricks anonymously supporting various old buildings, all those, those from the Curtis Brickyard, which once were part of three quarters of the part of the built town, of the built town are more significant. The architectural wonder of the big chimney, a monster that required orders of 500 cords of wood at a time for its feeding, was filled by explosives in 1913. And Mr. Roy was there on hand in 1913 when the explosives were put to the base of the chimney and down it came. There's another view um, taken from a distance of, uh, of a cloud of dust over the, uh, this market, uh, sorry, of the No Frills parking lot area, which uh, seems to indicate that the huge cloud of dust that, that came when the chimney came down. So what else is there? 
Well, there is Romain Street at the south end of Peterborough. How did that happen? Well, we go back to the 1874-75 map. When presented to the county for approval, the Register Colonel, Registrar, Colonel Haltain, said it would not do until the new streets being created in the south end down to Lansdowne Street were named. The names of adjacent property owners were an easy call. So we have Chamberlain and Westcott Streets, but Romaine? He was in the midst of serving his one year on council, which was no big deal. He was a strong-minded man with a mixed public approval rating, but he was the one publishing the map that needed a street name. So Romaine Street it was, seemingly named after what we have seen is a most interesting bunch of guys. Now, having tentatively concluded with that comment, I'd like to add that this is 2021 and it's time to consider alternate spins on history, including, of course, assessment of alternate facts. So here's another story for me to close with. From the early, from the mid 1860s, there was an important social service agency in Peterborough named the Protestant Home. It operated out of the stone building on Stewart Street behind Hutchison House and provided intermittent housing meals and care for the needy. It was run by the Protestant woman of status and competence, giving them a highly useful outlet for their skills. Town council gave a supporting grant, but when it occasionally wanted to exert some authority, it was told to get lost. The president of the Protestant home in 1874, when Romaine Street was named, indeed throughout all of the 1870s, was one Margaret Romaine, wife of our Robert. Under Margaret's leadership, the Protestant home in 1875 established the Dorcas Society, and early home hamper meals on wheels enterprise. Like all capable women, she engaged the man she held power over to support her causes. For example, in 1876, we have the review publishing Songs of Canada by Charlotte Lee as a fundraiser for homes for the aged poor. Margaret Romaine was a woman of competence and local prestige, worthy of having a street named after her. So if now in 2021, a revisionist approach to history with a feminist touch appeals to you, then the road going west to the Evanroot Centre in Peterborough must clearly be seen as a tribute to Margaret Romaine. Thank you for your attention.